to do. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'd like to welcome Josh David Miller, JDM, to present to you today how to create your startups. First pitch deck. So Josh, take it away. I well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me out here today. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks to the sponsors uh, who have made this uh, event, event possible. I'm really excited to be talking about startup pitches because I love startup pitches so much so that I've actually heard more than a thousand startup pitches. I don't think in this room that's the record. I imagine I'm beat by that. But I do say that I've heard an awful lot of, of startup pitches to give context to, um, to what I'm about to say because I've seen everything under the sun and I've seen things work and I've seen things very much not work. Um, and so hopefully I can share some of that with you today. So without further ado, I suppose we could just dive on in here. Oh, I will say, um, if you have questions along the way, I will have like some formal space at the end for Q&A, but feel free to throw up your Zoom hand or, or drop a question in the chat anywhere along the way. We're not gonna be so crazy and, and, and formal as to forbid you from talking at, at any time. So just use your Zoom hands or put it in the chat if you, uh, if you have a question. And with that, we can dive in. So uh, as, as Laura said, you know, our topic is creating your pitch deck, but that's not good enough for me. What's good enough for me is crushing your first pitch. So that's what we're going to work on today. And the theme of what I'm going to talk about is that pitching is really hard because it is, I'm not going to lie to you, but it's not complicated. And there's a big difference between hard and complicated. Hard is practice, complicated has to do with how much goes into it. And you'll see that not that much is actually going to go into it. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is, is Josh David Miller, do go by JDM. If you wanna make me feel all cool and everything, you can you know, spell that out as an acronym and just pronounce it JDOOM. That'll be my street name for the purposes of this conversation. I'm not gonna really waste any time telling you too much about me, I think I've, I've talked enough, you're not here to hear about me, but if you do want to learn more about who I am and what I do and all that stuff, or if you want to follow me around the internet or I'm on YouTube, I do all, I do all that stuff, then what you can do is check out that URL there, jdm.bio, and you'll find all the links to the relevant stuff there and information about me and my company and blah, 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 blah. So that's it for me. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Get all meta here. So sorry, I apologize. The font got a little, uh, little smaller. That was my, my typo. I'm breaking the rules that I'm going to tell you uh, not to break in a moment, but we're going to go through these basic things. We're going to talk about basically what goes into a pitch. I mean, basically what goes into a pitch. Then we're going to talk about Guy Kawasaki's 10, 20, 30 rule, which is kind of the one rule that you need to know to create a good presentation of any kind, but particularly a startup pitch. We're going to talk about the 10 slides that you just have to include in your pitch, not the 15 slides, the 20 slides, or 30 slides, or the five slides, but the 10 slides that you need to include in your startup pitch deck. We're going to talk a little bit about storytelling. That's going to be very light for the sake of time today and the role that storytelling can play in a good startup pitch. And then I'm going to conclude with some presentation skills, how you can do a good job at doing the pitch itself. All right, and then uh, we'll do some Q&A. And if I've been successful, your mind has been blown. And if not, I'm gonna go cry in a corner. Either way, you'll let me know by the end. So let's get started. Let's talk about basically what goes into a pitch. Okay, like let's just start with like really what is a pitch? So we use this word pitch and Laura mentioned, uh, I think one million cups earlier and something that Laura and I collaborate on, um, which is a, a really fun event. And we hear presentations from two founders every week but we don't call them pitches. And there's a very specific reason for that. There's a big difference between a pitch and a presentation. And it's this, the purpose of any pitch for anything is to change the behavior of the audience, meaning we want them to do something different than they were before they heard the pitch. That's what a pitch is. We're intentionally trying to change behavior. And in the case of a startup pitch, that could look like a few different things. You could be pitching to your customers, in which case the change in behavior is probably getting them to buy. You could be pitching to a co-founder, which might be getting them to collaborate with you. You could be uh, pitching, them, pitching a partner. You could be 
pitching a uh, any other type of uh, advice uh, mentorship, right, to join your 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 board or your board of advisors, but. We're going to be talking today about pitching to investors, but in all those cases, it's still the same thing. You're trying to change the behavior. And in the case of an investor, the behavior we want them to change is probably writing us a check. <laughs> That's what we want them to do. Before they heard from us, they had no intention of writing us a check. After they've heard from us, we'd really like please if they would write us a check. And that's the behavior that we're trying to change. And the way that we go about that process is by showing, not telling, but by showing what Alex Blumberg from Gimlet Media calls a credible theory of hugeness. And I love this term to describe what a startup pitch actually is. A credible theory of hugeness is three things. It's a theory of hugeness that is credible. Let's break that down because that's really, really important to talk about a startup. So let's start in reverse order. Let's talk about the hugeness, all right? So what we when we're talking about a startup that gets an equity investment at the end of the day, we're talking about something that can grow to a massive scale. It's only worth an equity investment if we're going to get really, really big. We want tens of millions or hundreds of millions in revenue. So it has to be huge, right? So that's the thing that we're selling this hugeness. But we have to have a theory of how we're going to get there because we don't have the tens or hundreds of million in revenue now. If we did, we wouldn't be pitching investors at this stage. So we need to figure out how we're going to get there. So we have this theory that we're going to go from here to this hugeness. This is how we're going to do it. We have this particular business model. We have this particular go to market. This is how we're going to get from here to there. But that's not enough because we're trying to change behavior, because we're trying to convince them. What we're actually talking about here is a theory that's credible, meaning a theory that's backed by evidence. It's a theory that makes sense. It's got the four C's. It's coherent. It's cohesive. It's compelling. And therefore, it is ultimately convincing. And therefore, the fifth C, credible. So we want a credible theory of hugeness. A startup pitch is a pitch that your startup can get really big, that you know how to get it really big, and that that theory that you're espousing makes sense and is credible. In a nutshell, that's a startup pitch. Okay, let's talk specifics. Let's get a little bit more specific now. Let's talk about the 10, 20, 30 rule because the 10, 20, 30 rule is the rule that I think that you need to know in order to really crush a pitch or any presentation for that matter. It's 10 slides. 20 minutes, 30 point font. Oh, and yes, question in the chat, who is Guy Kawasaki? So I did not even mention that at all. So I'm just, I take it for granted uh, that, that everybody knows Guy Kawasaki because we should all know Guy Kawasaki. So uh, Guy Kawasaki is an entrepreneur, is an investor and knows a crap ton about startups and pitching and investment um, and all those things. And he is kind of a guru when it comes to what makes good presentations. And so he's put out a lot of stuff out there, the 10, 20, 30 rule being, being among them. And also the uh, 10 slides I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes also come from Guy Kawasaki. Now, he kind of distilled the wisdom that's floating around in the ether, um, but it's really, really wise stuff. And so if you just Google Guy Kawasaki, 10, 20, 30 is probably going to be like one of the first two or three results on um, on Google's homepage, because that's that's really what we're looking at here. Um, and you can also read his uh, his book, which uh, Laura just put in the chat called The Art of the Start. Also a great book along with um, like Eric Ries and Steve Blank's books. It's uh, It's got some really good pearls of wisdom in there. So let's talk about 10, 20, 30 in a little bit more detail. Any presentation that you do, you wanna shoot for these general metrics. You're using 10 slides. We're gonna talk about why in a minute, but you can use 10 slides. You're gonna take 20 minutes to talk about those 10 slides, and you're not going to use any font in your deck that's smaller than 30 point. Okay, let's break it down. So start with 10. You only need 10 slides. I want to wrap about that for just a minute because this is often something that seems confusing. And so I'm going to come at this from a practical way and from a provocative way. So here's the practical side. The practical side of this is that we as humans are only so good at consuming information and really absorbing it. So you give us too much information and we're gonna miss a ton of stuff. Your average person misses a ton of stuff and an investor is your average person. 
Let's not kid ourselves about that. So they have the same level of listening skills that your average person has. And we need to talk to them as if they do. So what we want to do is give the most information that we can without losing things. And the magic number is 10 key points. If we give them 10 key points in 20 minutes, they're likely to remember the bulk of that. If we give them 20 key points in the same time period, we're likely not going to do that. We're going to lose too much information along the way that we really want them to absorb. So that's the practical side. Practically speaking, you try to put in more than 10 slides, most of it's just going to fall and you're, you're going to lose information and you're going to lose critical information. Okay, but let's come at this from the provocative side. The provocative side is if you need more than 10 slides to talk about your business, you don't know your business. And I'm gonna let that sit for a second because this is something that doesn't ring us uh, quite right oftentimes is we say, oh, well, I'm actually doing something really complicated. And so I, I like, I need, I need to do three slides to talk about like, you know, the, the technology behind it. I need to make them understand that like the reason that people have this problem is because back in 1947, right? Um, because we do all, we feel like we have to do all of that because there's all this information that we have to convey, but we don't care. We, the audience, we don't care. What we care is that credible theory of hugeness. And you can convey that any startup can convey that inside 10 slides, 10 key points, okay? So clarity is about how well you know something. That's the Richard Feynman, who is a physicist. It's Richard Feynman's principle that you, that you know something, you only truly know something if you can explain it to a five-year-old. And the way to do that is to get to clarity, is to get to simplicity. So that's the provocative way, 10 slides, it's practical, and it demonstrates you actually understand something. Okay, so I think I see some uh, questions going through here. So just want to make sure I didn't miss anything important here. Uh, okay, so uh, time parameters, which we'll get to now. So this is based, this 20 minute part of 10, 20, 30 is based on the idea that uh, uh, an investor often will slot you at an hour. They're going to spend an hour with you. Or if you're giving a presentation somewhere, it's often an hour. Um, for example, this presentation is something like an hour. So uh, an hour is often what we have to do. So you'd think like, oh, why am I only spending 20 minutes on it? Because 20 minutes isn't 20 minutes. So that's important point number one. 20 minutes will often be longer than 20 minutes. It's going to take you five minutes to get the HDMI cable plugged in uh, on, your, on your laptop. And, oh, I got to go pull out the adapter because they only have the, the USB-C or the you know uh, magic display port. And so I got to go change all of that or whatever. You're going to lose time with that. And you want plenty of time for Q&A. So if you're going to have an hour long pitch, you want to pitch for 20 minutes. You want to give them the information that they need, those 10 slides inside of 20 minutes, get all of that information conveyed, and then move on to Q and A. Okay. Um, there are some in the chat here, some details about, uh, for example, how the SAC Angels do, um, uh, do pitching. It's, it's always going to be different. You're always going to tailor it. The important thing to take away from here is not literally 20 minutes, but like if you're given more than 20 minutes, you really want to think carefully about whether or not you should be doing that. And then when you think about 10 slides, 20 minutes, you got to think about, okay, what does that look like if I actually need to do a pitch in 10 minutes? Or if I need to do a pitch in five minutes, you want to take the 10, 20, 30 rule and scale it down to something that's kind of proportional to what you're talking about. You're just going to convey a lot less information in that time period. Okay. I think I got that. Thank you for the compliment on my pocket square. Uh, okay. So um, that's 10, 10 slides, 20 minutes. And the last one here is 30 Meaning that when you're designing your pitch deck, whether you're doing it in, in Keynote or PowerPoint or Google Slides or whatever it is, at the end of the day, don't use a font smaller than 30 points. Don't use a font smaller than 30 points. And now this is a, it's not a, a rule, it's a rule of thumb, right? It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a rule of thumb. Because the idea here is that if you need to go to a font smaller than 30, you are probably trying to fit too much information on one slide. So when we're sitting and listening to you talk, or you're sitting here listening to me talk, you can either read the slide or you can hear me talk. I would prefer you hear me talk. 
So what I do and what anybody um, who's really good at capturing information, not that I put myself in that category, but anybody who's really good at conveying information is going to put on the one key point that they want you to take away. They're gonna put that one key point on the screen, which they can do in very few words. And that's the thing they want you to take away. It takes no time to read it because there's not very much text on there. So you can read it really fast and then you can listen to me and I can expand on it for a while. And I can talk and give you all kinds of other information, some of which you'll take in, some of which will serve to contextualize or concretize what's listed on the slide. But at the end of the day, I'm still gonna take away that one really important piece of information. If we have time later, I'll show you some examples of how that can look with even very complicated, um, complicated concepts on slides. But as a rule of thumb, don't go smaller than 30 point font. Okay, so that's 10, 20, 30. And the basic, the key takeaways for that is you can't convey as much information as you think you can. So focus on 10 key points. Even if you're given an hour, you need to allow a plenty of time for Q&A. So get your pitch down to 20 minutes. And then you can't put too much information on a slide or you will lose us, or we're gonna get lost reading what's on the text instead of listening to you. And that's no good because you're probably trying to tell us stuff. So keep the font 30 point or larger as a rule to keep yourself constrained to what fits on a slide. Okay, so that's 10, 20, 30. Let's talk about what those 10 slides actually are, All right? Let's break down what exactly must go into a startup pitch deck. And I'm gonna do these in order. We're gonna do slides one all the way through slide 10. All right, so the first slide in any startup pitch is what we call the introduction slide or the title slide. This is where we answer a fundamentally, just a really, really basic question, which is who the heck are you? Now, this is not, this is all my team. This is not, you know, all detailed bios of, of anything. It's, hi, my name is Josh. I'm here to talk to you about pitching, right? Um, it's who are we? It also usually has your contact information. Um, is any, any key factors about that, you know, the, the name of the company, the name of whoever's talking, has those basic things, but the most important thing that it has on you, this is the who the heck are you question, is that it has what we call an XY. We call it an XY because it's like the idea of we are the Uber for blank. So we say like, I am the, you know, I am the Uber for, you know, for this, or I am the Airbnb of, of, of that, or the eBay for this. What we're doing in that con is in that example is giving somebody a way to contextualize what we do. Now, if you don't have a metaphor like that, and I'm not actually even suggesting that you do a metaphor like that, you need to be able to say in less than a sentence, in a, in a fragment of a sentence, exactly what your startup does. It should be one of the first things out of your mouth is this is exactly what our startup does. The reason that you want to do that is that you don't want to wait a bunch of time before introducing who you are. And this is important because a lot of founders have this tendency to say, like, I'm going to wait for the big reveal. I'm going to go and say, like, uh, you know, I'm here to talk about this business. I'm not really going to tell you what it is yet. Here's the problem. And they go on this, on this tirade, this minute long tirade, this two minute long tirade about how big the problem is and oh, all these people, they're having this huge issue and it's terrible, it's awful and, and introducing, and then they throw in their solution at the, like, as this like, ah, moment. The problem with that is that we've lost interest because we actually don't know why you're telling us about the problem. And so we're spending that entire time because this is what we do for a living. We're spending the entire time guessing what your startup is. We're not really absorbing much of the information about the problem. So when you finally do say what you do, then we have to go back and rethink about, reprocess all of that context you gave us about the customer problem. We've missed a ton of stuff, okay? So don't, try to do the big reveal, it won't work. Start off very first slide, slide number one, say who the heck are you really, really, really fast and then include your key contact information. Okay. All right. Um, and yes, uh, to, to the uh, question in, in the chat, this is about the, most of this stuff, like particularly 10, 20, 30 is about uh, presenting it to 
a group of people in, in real time. If you are doing a, what we used to call a leave behind, you know, which is like the, you literally like left a copy in the room was kind of, kind of how that worked. Then you usually have a, a considerably more detail in there. And then of course you don't want to do the 10, 20, 30 rule because there ain't nobody there to give the context for that giant 30 point font. Um, so yes, two decks is, is absolutely, is actually right. Thanks Laura for answering that in the chat. All right. So that's slide number one. Let's move on to slide number two. Slide number two is the problem or the opportunity. Those are the same things to an entrepreneur when they hear a problem, they hear an opportunity. Problems aren't problems. Problems are opportunities to make money. That's how an entrepreneur thinks about things. So problem and opportunity are the same thing. And the basic idea behind the problem slide is that we want to understand exactly who the customer is. We want to know whom your startup is serving. We want to know what, uh, some basic demographics. We want to know kind of who they are and where they are. But more importantly, we want to know what pain you're alleviating for your customer. Because we want to understand what motivates them. So you're either creating a gain for a customer, entertainment, for example, or you're relieving a pain by making something easier or whatever, but you're relieving a pain or you're creating a gain. And that's what's gonna motivate a customer to buy. So we wanna understand the problem from the customer's perspective. And that means that we should walk away from this understanding two important things. We wanna understand first, like what is the customer's wants, needs, fears, jobs to be done, uh, pains, expected gains, right? We wanna understand the customer in as shallow as we can because it's only a 20 minute pitch, right? But we wanna understand who the customer is and why they're gonna be motivated to seek out a solution to this problem. Because if they're not motivated to seek out a solution to this problem, they ain't gonna buy your solution. And if they ain't gonna buy your solution, then they're not gonna make money at the company and I'm not gonna invest, right? That's, that's kind of how that works. Okay. Um, and the second thing that we really want to get out of this, this is the, the, the tangible result. This is the thing you'll look for when you're seeing the investors' faces. When you look at their faces, you want to see that you've actually changed their heart rate. Like when somebody's telling you about a problem that, 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 and, and the severity of the problem that it affects so many people, it should get our heart rate. It should change our pulse because it's exciting and it's a big problem. Do you want to actually convey all of that here? Okay, so that's the problem slide. 30,000 foot view, that's the problem slide. Um, so some questions uh, from the chat. Um, were customers the person paying, not necessarily the person using the service? Correct, these aren't always the same thing. So yeah, so um, in a multi-sided market where, where you have uh, two different kinds of users or more than uh, two different kinds of customers involved and you have to kind of satisfy all of them, the stereotypical one being like eBay, where you have a, a, you know, the, the buyer and the seller, and then you have you know, eBay kind of facilitating this thing. So they have two different markets there and you could be collecting money from only one of them and not money from, uh, from the other one. Um, so that's you know what we call a multi a multi sided uh, multi sided market, and um, the the idea uh, behind the problem is that you're trying to communicate how many people are going to resonate with your value proposition, which we'll get to in a second. But when we're talking about a multi sided market, you have two completely different value propositions. So on eBay the value proposition to the sellers is get rid of your old junk, for example, make money getting, you know, cleaning out your garage or cleaning out your attic or, you know, whatever it is. Like there's a, there's a, a monetary gain that people are expecting by selling their stuff on eBay. But on the flip side, uh, the, the people who are shopping on eBay are either, maybe they're looking for things that, that don't exist anymore or, or aren't available at the, at the market anymore um, because they're kind of retro maybe or, or vintage or whatever the term is we want to use with the hipster stuff that's out there now. Or it's um, you know, a, a matter of price. You can get it cheaper if you buy it used. You know, there could be all of those reasons, but they still both have pain. And so it's not just the person who has the money because the, it, let's say the seller's always the one paying or the buyer's always the one paying. In that case, not, they're not going to pay anything if you don't get the other side. So it's a kind of a difficult balance when you have a multi-sided market, but you still need to focus on, on, on both of them. It's just a little bit more complicated. Um, and we can take that in, in Q&A later if we want to get a little bit more specific about it. Um, so I think I answered the other question there. What if your uh, service appeals to a specific set of humans, say parents? Ideally, you want those who you are pitching to to have kids. Okay to ask that. No. 
Actually, I'm going to be controversial here and say you don't want that. And here's why. Um, so this is I, this is a really good question, uh, DJ. And so I, I appreciate you I appreciate you asking it because it gives me to talk about something that's not in my slides anywhere. Um, and that is like um, we a fundamental mistake that people make when they're pitching is assuming that the investors are your customers. And so when they say I things like I wouldn't buy that, maybe now we're trying to convince them why they should buy it, and that's a losing game. We're A, not gonna win, we're not gonna convince them, they've already decided no, and B, you have inadvertently um, hung your success on them being your customer. At the end of the day, an investor is concerned about making money. They don't care if they're the customer, they care if there are lots of your customer out there. They want to know that they're like, so in, when an investor says, like, I wouldn't buy that, it's perfectly okay. And in fact, oftentimes right to go, yeah, you're not my customer because blah, 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 blah. But you know what? Um, we have this data to show that these people will blah, blah, blah. And here's the evidence I have to show that because you're again creating a, a credible theory of hugeness. And it doesn't matter if that person that you're pitching to is actually going to be your customer. And if your pitch is dependent on them getting it at that level, then you need to find a different way to communicate it because that they're you're um, hoping that they care about something non-business related and you want to get them to care about the business side, which comes down to the math. Um, and Laura put a, a little bit punchier uh, uh, description in the, in, the, in the chat there for you guys. Okay, um, so I think, uh, I think that's all the questions there. So we'll go ahead and move on to uh, slide number three. So we got you know, an introduction, then we got the problem, right? So we got who the customer is and all that. And now that we know who the customer is, we know who you're trying to serve, we know that the person out there who has a problem, it's time, to, it's time for us to say, this is our value proposition to those customers. This is how we are, this is the value of what we're doing for that. This is where we start figuring out like what exactly is the pain, how, how are we alleviating pain? What are the specific things that we say that we're going to do for our customers? So this is when I was talking about eBay a second ago and I said like sellers care about cleaning their junk out of the garage for cash, right? That's a value proposition. We're giving them two. One, they make money and two, their garage is cleaner. Right, so that's a value proposition that we're giving to them. And on the same side, the seller's looking to acquire something that they can't buy anymore, that maybe is cheap um, because it's coming through eBay or cheaper than we, we would get at a department store or whatever. So those are our value propositions because we've said that these people out there have a pain or they're expecting some gains, they have some wants, they have some needs, they have some fears, they have some jobs to be done. And then the value that we're delivering to them is found in those things. So we're saying, and this is when we say our solution is, right? So when we talk about what our solution is, because we introduced the problem, now we got to say how we're going to solve it. So that's our value proposition at its core. Okay, once we have our value proposition underway, now we can talk about like exactly how it is that we do that. So this is where we say, okay, yeah, our solution is to, you know, uh, our solution is to, is to make money uh, for, um, you know, for people who have too much stuff in their garage by, um, uh, uh, helping them clean, help them clean out the garage by, you know, selling it online, right? If we want to do that value proposition, how we're going to do that is that we're going to create this marketplace that blah, blah, blah. And here's how this thing works. And so in this particular case, this is when, um, if you think about it, um, this is when we talk about what, what is our IP, like our intellectual property, if you have some, what is the technology or the process that's kind of making this thing work, right? This is like, literally like, how are we doing this thing? What, are, how do we deliver that value? And I apologize for the typo in the slide. So think about it this way. Um, you could say and put a bunch of words on there, kind of how something works. But if you start throwing schematics up, if you start throwing um, you know, a, a prototype up or, or something like that, if you have something of value, like we've done this thing and this is what the thing looks like, this is the opportunity to show us. Because um, Guy Kawasaki likes to say that if a picture is worth a thousand words, a prototype is worth a thousand pictures. And that's how you want to think about this. So if you can, anything you can do to concretize that value proposition, like this is actually how we're doing it and this is what it looks like. Here you go, here you can see this amazing thing. Then that's how you get, um, that's how you get that kind of communicated to us. Because we want to understand what makes you, you and how exactly you're accomplishing that at the end of the day. So what exactly are you doing? What's your secret sauce? What's your underlying magic? What's your IP? What's your tech look like? What's your process look like? What's the actual product? Not just the value it delivers, but what is the thing itself? Alrighty, so now 
and we've got that underway, it's time to get to kind of the important thing or what we think is all the important thing, which is the business model. So this is somebody out there has money, it's in their pockets, it's about to become, it's about to get into my pockets and here's how I'm gonna get it from their pocket to my pocket, right? So this is both the, like the revenue logic side of things. This is we're charging a monthly fee. This is we take a percent of transaction. This is where we have a markup on the goods sold in stores. This is where we are selling to distributors, right? Um, and uh, like whatever the, the actual underlying how you literally collect money is uh, under the scenes, this is when you have to communicate. This is how we're doing it. We're taking 10% of every transaction that comes through, whatever. You want to do that very simply. And this is where to go back to the question about if you have like a multi-sided market and like the, the person paying may not be the, you know, the, the primary user or whatever, this is where it can be, you need to be really clear about whose money you're actually taking. So if you, for example, have a two-sided marketplace, you don't want to just say we take a transaction fee because my question is who's paying. So you want to say we take a percent of transaction from the seller, right? And then I get, oh, okay. So it's free for the buyer and the seller is just taking a, a, a hit on the back end or whatever, but you have to be really clear about who that, who that is. So um, question in the, in the chat um, is uh, how detailed here is that um, for, the, for the business model, you actually want to be, let me actually rewind that. So I would actually challenge the premise of the question because oftentimes we think our business model is more complicated than it is. And usually if we want to boil that down to something really, really simple, it's a lot, it, it should be doable on like one simple slide with just a couple of numbers. If we have trouble boiling out to that something that's very simple, we probably don't understand it or we're including things that aren't relevant. This, the most common case I see this is when you have a startup who says, we're gonna charge you know, uh, this, this monthly fee and then there's an add-on for this and then we're also capturing money this way and then we're capturing money this way and we're also capturing money this way. And like, how do I convey that on a slide? And the answer is you kind of can't but it probably doesn't matter because if you're dependent on nine different revenue streams just to like make the thing work, you probably don't have something there. What is the business model is actually gonna make this thing work? And then it's okay to mention like, oh, and by the way, we have all these other cool ways that we can make some additional cash, but there's still a way that we're making money or two ways that we're, that we're making money. So um, if we have time at the end, I'm gonna show you an example of that because I think the business model slide is one where we can um, really demonstrate some of this these principles of like 30.5 and how you get, get to really clear on something. But I would say like um, how detailed to answer directly answer the question. You don't want to get too detailed. You want to keep it pretty high level, but you also want to understand your business model well enough to know that that, to what that high level actually looks like. Um, okay. So now that we've talked about the business models, we know how you're making money, we know where it's coming from, whose money you're taking. At the end of the day, we now need to figure out, okay, that only works if you can get customers. If you can get them in the door is the only way this works. So how are you going to get them in the door? This we call the go-to-market plan. Your go-to-market is you are sitting here now with maybe no customers, maybe some customers, but you certainly aren't at product market fit. You aren't at traction yet. Like we're, we're not ready to just blow this thing up with a you know, $20 million you know, series A or something like that, right? So how do we get from this tiny, like early progress that we have to a broad, to this broader success, to traction? Like, what does that look like? How are we going to get to customers? And this is where uh, some, some founders make a couple of key mistakes. So one mistake is ignoring the idea of efficiency. So uh, if you are having to pay for your first customers, meaning the only way you're getting customers in the door is by running ads, you're probably not onto something here. If you can't find people who want your product without paying to get in front of their eyes, then that is a big red flag. And it also has a really big impact on your long-term profitability. It might not actually be a viable business idea. But I would say if that's all you have right now is this idea of running ads, I would say to actually do some work to find other ways of reaching them because I bet there are. If it's a real problem and these people are out there, you can probably, you know, 19 times out of 20, find a way to get in front of them. So make sure that your go-to-market plan isn't, I'm just going to run a bunch of Facebook ads. That's one big, big mistake. Second big mistake that people make is to be really generic here. 
they'll say, oh, you know, we're going to go viral or we're going to use influencers. That, it's bullshit. Like there's no such thing as just going viral or betting on that. There's a really specific strategy. And if you can't articulate precisely what that strategy looks like and why it's going to work and why you can pull it off, there's nothing there. So you really need to convey how exactly you're going to get customers. If you're curious about how this can work, I recommend looking up um, a concept called 10X scaling. It's a very useful way of framing how you get your first 10 customers, how you get your times 10, so your 100 customers, times 10, your first 1,000 customers, and then uh, beyond there. So it's that idea of the first 10, then the next one, the next 100, then the next 1,000 are coming from a predictable set of patterns in a lot of startups. So if you Google 10x scaling, it'll give you a lot of information about how you can think about a go-to-market plan. But since we're talking about the deck today, that's not really our, our, our focus. I'm taking a lot for granted. Okay, so that's our go-to-market plan, all right? So now if we move on to slide number seven, that's our competition. So, all right, you have a problem out there that real people have and you have a solution and some magic sauce that's gonna get it done and you have a business model that's kind of interesting. If you can get people in the door, then you'll, you know, you know then this, this could make some money and you just told me about your go-to-market. So I think you can get some people in the door. So my question is who else is doing this, right? Who is, who's your competition? Um, who else is your customer spending their money on? Okay, so there's a couple, again, a couple of mistakes that people make in this part here. The biggest mistake that you can make at this slide is to say that you don't have competition. You do. You do have competition. And the, the when you say, oh, we don't have any competition or we don't have any direct competitors, what you're saying, what you're communicating to the investor is one of two things. Either one, you're dishonest and lying, or two, you don't know your market well enough. Both of those are terrible. You do not want to convey either of those things. You always have competition. Now, it might be true that you, nobody is making exactly what you're making and that you're doing something different. So there's nobody out there that's doing what you're doing, right? And so, okay, so we don't have any direct competitors. That's true, but that's why I phrase the question this way. Where else can your customer spend their time and money? They are spending their time and money elsewhere. It's not just free money that's sitting in the bank that they're just not spending. What are you taking away from? This is your chance to demonstrate that you understand your customers. And by the way, if it's a big enough problem, if your customers really have a big problem that expresses this big need that your startup could just be huge if you solve, then not only do you, even if you don't have direct competitors, your customers are probably doing something to try to solve it. It might be manual. They might be hacking something together. It might be used as like bastardizing a few tools to get it there, but they're doing something to solve this problem. They're not just suffering with it um, to no end. They may be unsuccessfully solving it, but they're still trying to do so. If they're not, if nobody's trying to solve it, it's not a real problem, okay? So make sure you understand your competition really well there, all right? Um, and then one other thing, and I hear this a lot from early stage founders, is that when you, the question that we're really trying to answer here, right, is like, why us? You know, why can we do this better than our competition? That's really what you're trying to call out. And so oftentimes we'll say, oh, well, we're more passionate. You know, like we have experience and background in this. I've experienced this pain. And so I'm more passionate than my competition. D don't, don't say that. It, it, it's, it doesn't matter at the end of the day if you're passionate or not. Money's going to make up the difference. I care that you're passionate and I want to see that you're passionate, but that's not going to make you beat your competition. Show that you're passionate because I love that. Investors love that. Investors want to, you to be really motivated to solve this because you're not going to get paid very much up front. And so you're going to be doing this for another reason and passion is probably the best one. So we want that, but it's not a reason for beating your competition. So don't do that either. Okay. Last thing, best way you can talk about competition, the absolute best way to talk about competition is to do the usual XY graph of your competition. So this is where you pick two, uh, ask two little qualities. And some of the competitors have one quality and some of the competitors have the other quality and some of them have none of the qualities, but you're the only one who has both of them. 
And these are really important. So what you do is you draw that x y, and then you show in the upper right hand corner, usually right up in this in this space is the is the you know where you have this is true and that is true. And in this corner, we are stand alone. No one else is competing for us in this space because it tells us about your value proposition. It tells you directly how you're comparing yourself to your competitors and how the, your how you think your customers going to compare yourself to. So that's the best way you can talk about customers. I'm sorry, it's the best way you can talk about competitors. Okay. So now that you have an understanding of the, of, of the competitors, we kind of understand everything outside the building. Now we want to kind of understand some things inside the building. So this is the team slide. This is who are the really key players on your team. We don't care about everybody. We want to know who the core founders are. We want to know uh, if you have some key super cool advisors on your team. Uh, that would be um, kind of uh, kind of awesome to, to show here or some really uh, uh, critical board members, or if you have some early investors that you want to advertise here, like who is it on your team that you can really, uh, that you can really show off here and show your team. Now, one of the ways that um, I, I see a lot of founders kind of trip here is uh, that there becomes an insecurity, like I'm nobody special and like, I don't have the perfect team. And so like, mm, I don't want to talk about the team. You, you kind of got to get over that because if you had a perfect team, you wouldn't be asking for investment. So all of the investors know when you pitch that you don't have a perfect team. So what you want to do is be honest about the team that you do have. You want to say, this is truly who we are and these are our strengths, right? This is what we can do. Don't be embarrassed about your team if there is a hole in your team that's important to be filled, you're going to get that feedback from uh, investors. And that's totally okay. It's normal. Sometimes it's going to be you need an industry expert co-founder. Sometimes it's going to be you need a technical co-founder. And sometimes it's other things. But you really do need that. Uh, you do need a, need a, a well-rounded team. And so don't, don't give into that insecurity. Actually say who you are because it's going gonna, it's gonna to serve you worthwhile. Um, yeah, I'll get to that question later. Good, good suggestion. All right, and uh, if we have some examples, yes, I'll show an example of the competition slide. All right, um, and there's many different ways to, to do it, but I'll, I'll show the picture that I talked about because I described it kind of poorly. Okay, slide number eight, now time for our penultimate slide. Our penultimate slide is uh, the financials, also known as the metrics, also known as the projections. So this is like what we all think of as like the nitty gritty, like a business, you know, pitch has to have all this stuff in it and it's true, but we, you have to give us a reason to care about it, which is why this is slide nine, because we don't care about any of this stuff until you've also proven it. So remember we talked about a credible theory of hugeness. You've already talked about the theory. You've already given, like you've pointed at how huge it could be. You've given some credibility to it. This is the point where we just get specific on what we mean by hugeness. This is where we put a graph up of our, of our hugeness. And what we're talking about here is how we're forecasting out what our startup revenue looks like over time. So over time is kind of vague and it's really gonna depend a lot on how much you know right now and what stick you, like what, um, what um, kind of phase you are in the startup life cycle. So if you're just starting out and you don't have anything really kind of done yet, then honestly, a three-year projection is just silly and it just sets up bad expectations. But if you are, uh, if you have a little bit of early data, you kind of know what your business model looks like and you can project that out three years, then you can get the hockey stick graph that Laura mentioned, right? That's the, the it goes, nah, 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 woo, right? Um, and that's what we want to see is that how big this thing can get over, over time. The other key point that's buried in here is it says, what does a bottom up forecast look like, not a top-down forecast. Bottom-up means how are we, like, for whom are we starting? How, how are we growing that upward? Meaning when we talked about our go-to-market before, we're going after some audience, and then we're going to get a bigger audience, and then we're going to get a bigger audience, and then we're going to get a bigger audience. And so our bottom-up forecast looks at it from individual groups of people, not from populations as a whole. So the big mistake that founders make here is they do top-down projections. They do top-down financials. And this is the most common version of this is the joke of like, if we only capture 1% of people in China, then we'll be rich. A, you're not going to capture 1% of people in China. And second, that's silly. And third, it doesn't have anything to do with your business. So we don't want to start like, oh, if only we capture 1% of, you want to say, what can you reasonably get? If you want to look more about um, 
some of those uh, uh, kind of details that Google Tam Sam Som, T A M S A M S O M, it's three words, Tam Sam Som. Um, that's again outside the scope of a pitch deck talk. Um, if we have time in the QA, happy to talk about it. But those are the kinds of things that we're looking at where we're going bottom up um, to, to, to something there. So, and yes, if uh, to answer the question in the chat, if we have time, we'll go through some examples. And otherwise, yeah, we'll just share them afterward. All right. So now it's time for our very last slide of the 10 slides. This is when you ask for something, also known as the, the call to action. This is when you're saying like, okay, well, investor, this is what I need from you. Here's what we've got so far. Here's our current progress to date. This is like, I told you about this cool, amazing secret sauce MVP thing that we got going on, right? Um, here's how much of that's done. Here's how much is not done. And we're going to get it done by this time. And in order to do that, I need this from you, whether that's advice or money or, or whatever else. So the ask, right? What do you want from the person who's listening? This is where you've, you've pumped them up so freaking much that now it's about behavior. They're already wanting to change their behavior and you're just telling them specifically what to change. Okay. So this is where you put in the ask. This one is the most complicated one to talk about in this context because it's going to be so different for each individual startup. So that's why I phrased it this way, kind of where are you right now? Where are you going? And what do you want from me in order to get you there? Like I need X number of dollars and I'm gonna spend it this way. Um, so it's that kind of thing. And that might look pretty different for, uh, for you. Okay, so we do have a couple more things to, uh, to, to talk about here, um, but I wanted to make sure that there aren't any big questions that we have lingering. So I want to pause for just a second here. Anybody? I don't think there's any questions, Josh. Okay. Uh, cool. I mean, there may be some new ones, but there aren't any hiding. Okay, uh, great. Then I will not hunt. Um, thank you for helping out there. Okay, so our, our final two topics are storytelling and presentation skills. And so I'm just gonna spend a very, very brief amount of time talking about stories. Um, that's because uh, this is all a big and complicated topic and it's difficult to cover in this, uh, in this time when I wanted to spend the bulk of our time talking about literally what goes into the pitch deck since that's what you were promised at the end of the day. But I, I'm titling this section here like the power of stories, because we have this idea in business culture about how powerful stories are, that stories have the power to do real things. And that's true. Now, stories are not universally good. Um, in fact, um, there's a great book. I'll, I'll drop a, a link in the chat that just came out recently, um, like Goldshot. And the, the, uh, the book is about how uh, uh, stories are really mercenaries. Stories will do things for us and they're not inherently good or bad. And we can put them to a good end or to a bad end. But the end, like uh, you can think of a story as a Trojan horse. Uh, for those of you like from the story, it's like the, 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 the uh, Trojan army built, like built the, 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 the horse and um, hid their soldiers in it, you know, brought up the castle. Oh, look, a gift, right? Brought it inside, doors closed at night. They go out and slit everyone's throats, right? So the idea is that we can sneak in what we want under the auspices of a, of a really good story. And so what we want to do here is actually convey our information in the most powerful way possible. And one of the ways we can do that is with a story. So uh, there are a couple of ways that this, that this looks like that I want to, to talk about. So one big way that this looks like is in literally telling a story. So this is when we do something like give them a use case when we're talking about the problem, like meet Bob. Bob is a builder. Bob as a builder can't get his hands on quality lumber, right? That's when we start telling that story of it to illustrate what the problem is. That can be a very powerful way to like to trigger our empathy. And when we trigger our empathy, that gets us connected. It gives us a frame of reference for that. It gives us the summary of like the archetypal customer experience. Okay, and so it's a device to do that. And anytime you tell a story, there's always three pieces. You set some context, Bob is a builder. 
right? Um, you say what, uh, and, and that Bob can't get his hands on lumber and therefore Bob blank, right? So you tell what happens. And the third, you tell how it ends. Bob wins, right? Or Bob loses if you're just talking about the, the problem. So you always like set context, say what happens and how it ends. And telling stories about your, about your customer in that archetypal way really is part of the problem is really and powerful because then you can come back later on and keep referencing Bob. And you have this little, this weird psychological trick that you can use to constantly like flick little parts of our brain. So you tell us the story about Bob and we're like, okay, I'm with it. Like, oh yeah, Bob, this sucks for Bob, right? And then you move on later and you start talking about uh, the solution. And when you're talking about the solution, you say, and so what we can do for Bob is and you just flick my brain again with that story. Because again, it's that mercenary that you can put to work. Uh, to do that. So telling a story in that way and then referencing it throughout your pitch can be a really, really uh, powerful way to do it. Um, and a uh, question from the chat, um, maybe a silly question, but the story or stories are incorporated into the 10 slides, yes. Um, so not a silly question, um, yes. So the idea is you still have these 10 slides of information, but what we're talking about um, or, or how we convey that can be a little bit different. And 10 slides is like a, a, you know, a high level rule. So you can take a couple of slides to talk about your problem, but you wouldn't want 10, like, three slides of different information, it would be three slides illustrative of the, of the problem, not expanding on the information, but telling a story in a progressively revealing way, way more complicated than we have time for, time for here. But the short answer to the question is yes. So like you can introduce the story of a customer on your problem side. And then when it comes back to the solution, you can say, you can bring Bob back in. And then when it comes back to later, you know, hey, when you kind of talk about go to market, hey, there are X number of Bobs out there. This is why we can be so big because Bob's not alone. In fact, there are a hundred million Bobs, right? It's that kind of thing that you can use as part of your, as part of your question. Um, okay, um, I think that's all I want to say about that side of stories. But what I do want to mention is like the flip side of stories is that your entire startup pitch is actually a story. And we don't think about it that way, but these 10 slides that we put in this particular order are put in this particular order because they tell a story. So I'm gonna tell the story of a startup that doesn't exist, it's an abstract thing. I'm not even gonna contrive it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blah, blah, blah out, you know, yada, yada, yada out the, the, the detail bits here. I'm gonna tell you the story of a startup for all 10 slides, okay? So here's how it works. All right, so there are all these customers out there and they have this really, really big problem. And you know what? We have this really awesome solution. If we charge X dollars, then we can make Y dollars and we can make this work because our competitors, they blah, 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 blah. And we have this really amazing team because they yada, 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 you know, and so much so it's so great that we've actually made all this progress already. And what's next for us is we're gonna do this thing. And all we really need in order to do this amazing thing is Y dollars from you and Z support and we go and crush this. It's one big story that you're, that you're telling. Big customers, big problem, awesome solution, big potential. And here's how it all works at the end. So you're telling a story even across 10 slides. All right, that's all I wanna say about, uh, about storytelling. Um, uh, so I wanna, I wanna make sure that we have time for, for a question at the end. So I wanna talk uh, for a minute here about presentation skills. And then I do see a couple questions in the chat that we'll definitely get to. All right. So I said at the top, pitching is really hard because pitching is really, really hard. It's very, very, very difficult. And I want to talk about some of the ways that we can make that a little bit easier on ourselves. Okay. And the first thing is this idea that it's hard, but it's not complicated. And what I mean by that is not that it's, it's simple because it's not, not that it's easy because it's not, it's really, really hard, but there's not that much that we're talking about here. We have 10 kinds of information. They're specific to our startup, but there's 10 kinds of information that we want to display. We're going to talk for 20 minutes. We're going to put some visuals in the slide. It's not complicated. It's really hard, but it's not complicated. So uh, to that uh, effect, let's talk about some of the ways that we can make this easier. So I want to talk about uh, the actual art of presenting the actual talking bit, right? That piece of it. So here's what we have. First thing, most important thing that you can do, literally the most important thing you can do is practice, 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 all right? Five times is not enough times to practice. We're talking about 20 times, 30 times to practice. The more times you practice, the better it's gonna get. And yeah, practicing on your own just to get flow and rhythm, that's fantastic. But nothing is going to be presenting to an audience because then you can test for clarity. You can test if things are landing and then you can pitch to someone else. This is where like you practice your elevator pitch by telling it to everybody. 
you go into you go into temple and you go to get a coffee and you tell the barista they say how how are how are you oh i'm working on blah 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 oh what's blah 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 boom right and you give them your pitch right there and it's not going to land and then you're going to you know next day different barista pitch it again right and you keep going through that process and no matter how um, and it's just going to get better and better and better over time when you're talking about a pitch that's 20 minutes long it's the same thing it's just 20 minutes of it there's so much more opportunity to really perfect your pitch so practice 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 Second is you have to have clarity as your goal. So remember, on each of those 10 slides, you have one takeaway that you want them to have. And you need that takeaway, preferably to be visual in some kind, and your whole arc across all 10 slides, and then the little mini arcs in each of the 10 slides all need to have a clear narrative arc. They need to have a story to them of some kind, even if that story isn't, here's Bob, you know, whatever. It still has a, a discernible story like I gave about our startup example before. Third is it's really important that you know your audience. Too often, founders just have this generic deck and no matter where they present, they give a generic deck that doesn't get you that much value. You want to know exactly who's in the room. You want to know what they want. What are the kinds of companies that they invest in? What's their risk tolerance? Are, is it early stage or late stage? They have um, preferences for certain kind of, uh, of, of industries, right? Are they special? Like, do they really love two-sided markets or are they really into the crypto space or whatever? Really understand who they are and then you can tailor your pitch to them. So really know your audience because it makes a really big difference. Fourth, and I cannot overstate this, be authentic. And I don't mean that in a cliched way. I mean this in a very tactical, you're going to be more successful way. People who are authentic are people we like. This is business, but we want to work with people we like. Nobody wants to work with a douchebag. So don't be a douchebag. And what that means at the end of the day is that you have to understand who you are. You have to understand your temperament and you have to not try to be somebody else. Don't be like, I saw this great pitch on whatever and like, I want to pitch like that guy. If that's not your style, don't try to pull it off. It won't work. You have to know who you are because you are awesome. So be who you are because you are awesome. Don't try to be somebody else because the game of make-believe is going to blow up in your face. So be really true to who you are and also have humility. And this is really important too, because what happens oftentimes when you see an early stage startup pitch is when they get a question from investors that they don't know, necessarily know the answer to, or that they find just an impertinent question, that they will then get defensive. And then they'll, they'll put up their ego wall and not hear what the investor is saying. And what happens in that point is you are not convincing, no matter how good you think you are, that their job is to be a bullshit detector. Anybody who hears a lot of pitches has a really good bullshit detector and they're going to see right through it and they're not going to like you. They're going to know what you're doing. They're going to know why and you didn't convince them. It's a lose, lose, lose. So you want to be authentic and be, and be humble. When you watch somebody pitch who's pitched for their, you know, this is their pitching for the third or fourth startups. When they're pitching at that level, they don't try to convince you of everything. Yes, it's easier for them because they have these exits and that's really powerful, right? Because uh, you know, past uh, success is a, is a predictor of future success when it comes to, to people. So you want to bet on good people. So it's true, it's easier for them, but also they're going to connect better with investors because they are humble. They know what it's like to be in that space. They know it's okay not to know things and they're going to be upfront about what they don't know. This is a big gap. And that gap is either going to be figure outable or that gap is going to need to be filled by team or filled by an investor or, or an advisor or anything else, but they understand what those gaps are. Because if you, if, but if you try to lie about them or if you try to like sell in that process, it's not gonna work, okay? A uh, question in, uh, from the chat here, what are frequent BS detectors investment investors ask? So I don't know, everybody's gonna have their own ways of doing this. And so I'm not necessarily referring to like specific questions that people ask because they're not trying to find your bullshit. It's just that when we hear somebody talk about this because it, they follow patterns, like I just gave you like 10 slides, right? Like follows pattern. Because it follows a pattern, we understand what we're hearing and we understand how people are talking about something. And so we're able to see through things like you may know your business, you should in theory, know your business better than anybody else, but we know startups and startup pitching better than most people. And because we do, we're able to compare what the story you're telling with a massive treasure trove of data and figure out, are we doing this right? 
right? It does this make sense? It does this fit into our existing patterns? And that's where it more um, comes into BS detector. There are specific questions that, that people can ask, and this is gonna come down to personal preference for how they do it. Like if we're like, hmm, that's interesting. So like, um, uh, if I if I feel like, and this is not happening in an investment context, but when I'm reviewing a pitch and uh, I feel like that, that they don't understand their customer well enough, there are questions that I'll use that give them an opportunity to show off how much they know about their customer. And if they can't do it, not only did it answer my question, it told me a lot more. It told me that they really don't understand their customer space and then they're not ready. They're not ready for, for whatever the next step is. They need to take two steps back and go learn more. Um, so it's more, it's more that, that style. I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. Okay, and very last here is I wanted just to take a minute and talk about how presenting virtually is different because we're still probably gonna be doing a lot of this. Um, and we're not all the way back to in-person yet. You're gonna be pitching virtually and pitching virtually is really hard. It's harder than pitching in person. Pitching virtually is really, really hard. So here's four additional tips if you're pitching in, uh, in, on, on Zoom or, or something. First is just like you practice your pitch, practice your tech because something's gonna go wrong. It really is. I've had things go wrong in pitches before. Things go wrong all the time. And we have, um, I did see a comment in Slack about not being able to hear me. Was that them or me? Can somebody just let me know if they hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so you. yeah, thank you very much. Um, all right, sorry about, sorry you're having technical difficulties. Um, okay, so um, the, things are going to go wrong. They're just going to, things are going to go wrong in person too. Like I made the joke about the HDMI cable, but like, um, but in, 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 in online, there's so much more kind of to go wrong and it's way more awkward when it goes wrong, right? So really practice the tech, go on to the exact same platform you're going to be using and practice in a dry run more, more times than you think is necessary until it just becomes, you know, kind of fluid. And then just roll with the punches when the tech doesn't work because there are going to be times the tech doesn't work. Okay, um, so next, um, is don't be complacent. And this happens a lot because we are sitting in front of our, our, our computer and we're you know talking into a screen or just looking at the, the camera here is we kind of get this to the point where it doesn't feel like a real pitch, but it is real. It's just as real as it is in person. The people on the other side of the camera here are real. It's a real audience. And it's because it's even harder on there, we have to try even harder. So resist the urge to go like, oh, it's just a Zoom thing. It's not just a Zoom thing. It's like, oh man, not only is it a pitch, it's a Zoom pitch, right? You want to think about it that way. It's not this, it's this, okay? So you want to think about it being better. Don't get complacent when that, it just doesn't work. So one of the things that I do is because I'm talking to you guys now is I'm standing up. I have a sit-stand desk and that helps me. And that's actually really the only purpose for the pocket square that Laura commented on earlier is that it's because this is kind of my way of saying, of saying to myself, not to you, but to myself, like I'm in this, right? And so that uh, instead of just sitting in my chair and kind of like, you know, doing whatever, um, personal preference, but my, the point is don't become complacent. Third is don't read from a script. So way too often people read from their slides and you really should not read from your slides ever. And if you're reading like the, the, if you have like five words on the screen, yeah, you can say those words out loud. But if you have this, like I'm not reading what's on here. I have detail for you. Also, this is because you guys can have this deck later on uh, and you want to go back and kind of kind of see what, what I meant by don't become complacent. But I'm not reading the sentences off of here because I don't, because that would be really, really boring. It'd be really, really, really dull. And people think that when you're on Zoom, you can get away with it because they can't see that I'm like reading from something or whatever, we can tell, we can always tell, unless you are really good and have your teleprompter lined up. If you have, if you can, if you got all of that, then maybe, but almost nobody pulls that off. And we know that you're reading, we know that you're coming off the notes and it doesn't sound right. So get off your notes. The point is not to get every word right. The point is to get the point across. And in order to do that, you just need to understand the material, understand your key points, totally okay to have an outline, totally okay to have an outline, understand what your key points are, but then talk about the key points. And that's why you run through the pitch 20 times. So you get really used to talking about the key points. And then you don't miss key points because you got your outline there, but you're not reading from it because reading is really, really boring, which leads me to the last thing. Please don't freaking bore me. Way too often pitches are just boring. And this applies to in-person too, but distractions are so, so, so much easier online. You can't even tell when somebody's distracted. Somebody can be playing on their phone and you're not gonna know. 
Somebody's going to be, I could be checking my email right now while I'm talking to you. And you may not know, I'd probably seem a little distracted. But if you were talking, I was checking my email, I'd be looking right here and you wouldn't even know. So distractions being so much easier, you have to be really cognizant of not boring people because boring sucks. Not only do we not want to work from boring for boring people or with boring people, but also you're trying to convince it, you're trying to change your behavior, you're trying to raise our heart rate. And there are lots of ways to do that. So my style is to be highly engaging or I try to be highly engaging. I try to be high energy and I'm standing here and I gesticulate like a crazy person yelling at traffic. Like that's my style. That doesn't have to be your style. There are lots of ways to do this. You aren't boring. You just may be interesting in a different way than I am. Lean into your style and lead with a natural passion that's causing you to get up every day and think about your startup because that's what you're doing. Something's keeping you going. Put that into your pitch, right? Um, so try really hard not to be boring. Okay, so that is the end of my formal remarks here. And so I really would love to, to spend some time doing some, uh, some Q&A. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up a couple of uh, example slides while we're doing that. But Laura, did I uh, miss any questions in the chat? I think I did. Uh, no, I don't think you missed any. I was... I was distracted in having some conversations with people because it was a Zoom meeting. Just a joke, right. then. Um, but uh, I do think it's worth saying, and while you pull up your slides, I can say it, and then you can decide that your pitch isn't what's going to convince investors to invest in you. It's what's going to convince them to have another meeting with you, possibly to uh, enter into what they call a due diligence stage where uh, where you can you know they can really find out more about your company. So uh, I just thought I'd I'd make that point. That's one reason why you don't have to tell them everything. You just want to make them curious uh, to learn more and convince them that you know you've got something that could potentially make them money. And I think a lot of uh, startup founders forget that in investors invest in you to make money. So you have, you know, that has to be something you're thinking about when you put your, your pitch deck together. They don't care how great your product is. They just want to know if you're going to be able to sell it, if people are going to buy it for a profit that, you know, you can make a profit and that, uh, you know, in three to seven years, they're going to make a 10x return on your company. And, and that's what investors are looking for, by the way, a 10x return. Okay, done. I'm off my soapbox. No, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you mentioning that because I think a lot of us just like think if you're not in the world that it's like Shark Tank, that you go on and give your pitch and they're like, I'm in, bro. Right. But that's not that's not the way it works. You're, you're asking for permission to take the next step. So I think that that's um, that that's that's a really important, uh, really important point. I'm glad you called that out. Um, Okay, so um, yes, there was a question about Tam Sam Sam. I put what they stand for in the chat, and then um, if we if we have time all the way at the end, I'm happy to talk about it. But uh, otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll kind of punt on that for now because it's not specific to a pitch. And um, uh, okay, and yes, we'll make the slides available. And then okay, so a question from Janaya: If you have holes in your pitch, no mentors, little capital raised, can you still put together an effective pitch? <laughs> Um, so the, the, the answer is yes. Um, I'm laughing a little bit because um, you're, you're kind of really putting yourself down there. And so there's two ways I want to respond to that is so that the one is like, okay, but what's all the great stuff? Right? What, what do you what do you know? right now? Like, what is the information that you actually have? What's the progress that you've made to date? Do you have a problem? Have you demonstrated a lot of people have this problem? You know, have you done solution validation? Um, do you have data to, to show that, right? Do you have research along those lines? Like, like, what, like, where are you in that spectrum? And then focus on this is what we have. And then what, then the story becomes what's next is where those holes are. What's next for us is blank, right? And so that's what the story becomes this and this is all pretty cool and encouraging and here's our next step and that next step might be different which leads me to the second way i wanted to respond to this which is to say that um you that when you say is it can i still put together an effective pitch i say unqualified yes but the asterisk on that is really dependent on what you're pitching for so there are companies that are not fundable yet 
And that's just because they don't have enough data behind them to warrant that investment. So Laura mentioned that investors are looking for 10x returns on, on, on something like that. And that's like, on the on the on the low end, right? For 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 that kind of thing, like a, for for some startups, you're looking for way more than that. Um, but the reason you're looking for that is because an investor is a portfolio, and they have math behind how they invest their money. At least the good investors do. That says that I need a 10x return because of the 10 companies I invest in, five are going to fail outright, three are going to like you know kind of do okay-ish. And then, you know, one's going to make some money, but it's not going to be appreciable. And I need that last one to be a big hit because that's going to make up the money for the other 10, right? Or for the for the other eight that didn't do any money. So there's math behind that. And so that's why like there's a comes a point when you don't, your the math doesn't work out for you yet because the risk is too big. And so what you're doing through the startup process is de-risking. And so whatever the next de-risking stage is, there comes a, there, there, there's a point before which you can't use cash to de-risk unless it's your own cash or friends, family, and fools cash um, because it, the, the math just doesn't work out yet. So you might be pitching for something else. You might be pitching for like, like I want to stay connected because, you know, you think I'm awesome. Like, let's, let's stay connected that way. And like, I, I could use some, you know, some connections or, or advisors or there's other things you could be pitching for that aren't money, even if you're not fundable. So you can still put together an effective pitch, but at a certain, but before a certain point, you cannot put an effective pitch for money yet because you just don't have enough data behind it. Josh, there was a question a couple folks had about whether or not you should do a live demo of your product during your investor pitch. Oh, that's a fun question. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I think it's going to, okay. So I, I'm, I'm hemming and hawing here because I was initially going to say no, um, but I actually want to maybe make that a little bit more nuanced. So um, the I think it's going to depend on a couple of factors. Anytime you do a live demo, you're increasing the probability of something going wrong in your pitch. And it's the worst time for something to go wrong in your pitch. So just for that reason alone, I would say it's not like if you have to pull out phones and like demonstrate your app, I would say no, unless there's a super compelling reason you have to do that. Better to create a, a video of that happening, right? Of the, of the stuff that you wanna walk them through, embed that in your deck and then talk through it in real time. That would be a better way to do that that kind of de-risks your pitch a little bit. If you're having a physical good, like it can be very cool to like demo, like, hey, boom, prototype, right? And you can kind of throw it at them and, and let them play around with it, which can be a really cool thing to do. So it's going to be, I think it's going to be more nuanced about whether or not you should like demo your prototype, but I would lean toward like, what is the, what is the safest way that you can convey both the the quality of the work that you've done, the volume of the work that you've done and the quality of the work you've done and what they, that you're trying to give that as evidence for. If you can, what's the safest way to convey those two things? And if that is with a real demo, then great. And if it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would, Laura put it very well in the chat, never depend um, on your prototype because it's going to be times when it ain't going to work. And then that's going to feel real bad. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so more specifically, it was um, never depend on having internet access when you give your, your pitch. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to show a video, make sure that video resides on your computer. Um, because there's going to be times when the internet just is not working. Trust me. Yes, I've been there too. It sucks. <laughs> um, so another question in the chat. Um, thank you for the compliment, Gina. And then uh, should we focus on one customer persona when talking about the problem or multiple? So that's a complicated question. It's going to depend on a lot of specifics. So the short answer is that when it comes time to talking about your go-to-market, you really should be focusing on your early adopters, right? And so at that point, you, I don't care how many personas you have, you can't go after that many. You're gonna have to like really prioritize and focus on one to go after. So if, you're, if your product can service like 10 different personas, then you really need to like focus on one, comma, but, when you're talking about the size of the problem, it is the kind of thing that you want to convey. Um, so the, you don't have time to talk about a bunch, like 10 different ones all at the same time. Like you're just not gonna be able to do it. You can't tell 10 different stories. It's just not gonna work. So you wanna tell the story of the first one you're going after um, or the, the biggest you know, segment that you're going after as long as you can connect those, those dots later on. Um, if that answers your question, the, the, uh, the exception to that is if you're doing a multi-sided play, then you have no choice but to talk about both of them. You have to, because it doesn't work without both of them. Subject to a couple of caveats. Um, 
Um, Jared makes a joke, demo doesn't equal a thousand pictures. Um, no, and a prototype does equal a thousand pictures. I'm just saying that uh, the real life version of it may not, uh, may, if it goes wrong, instead of a thousand pictures, you had a, I don't know, a negative 10 pictures or something like that. So video it instead. Yeah, there, um, someone wants, uh, Kevin asks, are pitch decks typically shared with investors prior to the meeting? So they have had opportunities to read ahead or is the first time they see your company is, uh, or your slides is when you share it. What would you say to that, Josh? And I have an answer to that too. <laughs> Sorry, can you, can, you, can you say that one, one more time? Are, in, are pitch decks typically shared with investors prior to the meeting? And basically, can you if you've shared them prior to the meeting, can you depend? Can you expect that they have looked at them? <laughs> and the answer to the second question is definitely no. <laughs> um, and the answer to the first question, like, should you share it in advance? Like, I, I, if they ask for it, then I think you do have to because otherwise it's going to seem like you have something to hide, and that would be weird. Um, but if they don't ask for it, I, I guess I would kind of like. Okay, so. Processing in real time. I think the answer is I don't see any problem with sharing it in advance because it you really should be transparent about things and things should be clear. Um, that having been and, and it can be a filtering mechanism, which isn't bad. So I think all things being equal, yes, but I don't think I would like I would never make the choice to like send my deck in advance to an investor just because and then and ask them to read it because. Uh, they probably won't. And if they did, it's absent the context of it to give. And I don't know how interesting that is. I don't know. What's your answer, Laura? Um, well, um, first, uh, if you sent them the deck, don't expect them to have read it, uh, yeah. you know, with your pitch. Most, uh, I know most angel groups have a process where you apply to be considered to present to the group. And one of the, they usually ask, for a pitch deck, but it doesn't have to be your final pitch deck. It could be whatever pitch deck you have and you can hone that later. So, um, and there will be a, a subset of that angel group, a selection committee that will look through those things, uh, maybe even invite you to a screening. Uh, I know the SAC angels do this. They'll narrow it down to four companies to screen and then two of those companies get selected for the angel meeting. So uh, if you're pitching to angel investors, yes. I would also say um, venture capitalists, most venture capitalists probably wanna see, someone in that group wants to see a pitch deck and they'll probably ask you for it. It'll be part of the process um, before they invite you to present to the group. Yeah, I, good points. Yeah. Um, okay, another question is, my product can do X and that's when we will really make money, but we need money yours to pay a dev to make this. So yeah, that okay said more eloquently. So a couple of thoughts on that. So the first is when you say my product can do X and that's when we'll make money, but I need a developer to do it. Then my response is your product actually can't do that. Um, you say, and I know, I know what you mean, DJ, like, um, uh, so, but, but yeah, right. Um, so I think it's, um, I'd be cautious about that too. And I'm going to give the answer two different ways. So one way is um, to say like, let's say you have an existing product out there. You've made it. It's an MVP. It's working. Um, it's not making a ton of money yet because you were proving a small concept and that small concept, yay, we got data for it. But now to actually build the thing is really going to take some big, you know, uh, some big investment. Then yeah, you can, that is perfectly acceptable pitch. I don't know if it's the best one. I'm going to come back to that in a second, but like you can do that because you have a thing out there that you've demonstrated value for, you have data behind it. And then therefore you can tip the, like the, the gamble in your favor. On the flip side though, if you don't have that MVP and that data yet, I actually think it's a really tough ask. Um, because there's a lot of things that you can do prior to having a dev to get data to get real validation for prior to investment. And so th that'd be all kinds of no code solutions that could be some real customer discovery and customer validation experiments that you run, uh, where you know you can get real qualitative and quantitative data back. Um, to, to kind of show that this is worth, you know, making that next step. And then obviously also you can get a technical co-founder uh, to help out with that, which I think is probably 
all things being equal, best asterisk asterisk, plenty of footnotes. Um, but that's that's the big the big picture. Of that so I mean, short answer is, is yes, but you want to make sure that you you still have uh, credibility, like there's a credible theory of hugeness, and that's going to require some kind of data. And absent any type of product out there, it's harder to do. Um, so you want some type of experiment. Um, Okay, Matthew asks, if we're aware of holes in our plan, how about pointing them out ahead of time in the pitch? Um, so, yeah, good, good question. Um, I'd love to hear Laura's thoughts on this, on this, on this too, because she's probably heard more pitches than I have at the end of the day, um, or, or at least we're, at least we're in competition, if not. And um, so, if there are holes in your plan, pointing them out ahead of time, I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, as long as you know what, as long as it's contributing to the story. So if you're saying that we don't know blank and so therefore our next step is to figure out blank, we're gonna do experiment Y and in order to experiment Y we need, you know, the capital or whatever. Like if it's that kind of thing, then I think that that's great. Um, if there are certain things that are just kind of generally unknown, I don't know if it makes a lot of sense to point them out because again, we're trying to like change behavior. But when they come up in Q&A, that's when I would say like, yeah, you're, you're right. We, we don't have an answer that we've thought about that. Here's what we do know around that. But we think that's figure outable because I think that that's kind of how I would generally do it. What are your thoughts, Laura? Yeah, I like uh, waiting to the Q waiting until the Q&A that uh, but being transparent, not lying. If it comes up in Q&A and and you really don't know the answer, I think Josh mentioned this before, or if it's something that you need to do you know, more research about to, to let them know that you have a plan in place to discover, you know, whatever that thing is or, or fill that hole. But I wouldn't be like humbly pointing out all your, all the holes in your business during your pitch deck. I would keep that more uh, focused on what you do know, not what you don't know. Yeah, definitely agreed. Um... Okay, I think we got that. How do we do due diligence on the investor before we approach them? Is there any resources or is this a case of just their website and LinkedIn? I mean, it starts with that, sure. Um, oftentimes, you know, you have better chances if you know people who know them or know people who know them who know them, right? That kind of thing, because um, you want to do that. There's also, you can do um, research on um, uh, AngelCo and um, oh, what's the other one, Laura? The other platform that has all the funding data. Crunchbase, AngelList. Crunchbase and AngelList, right. Yeah, those are the two I was thinking. So if you can go like Crunchbase and AngelList and, and you can get some data that way. Um, the, so yes, I think there are lots of ways that you yeah. can get um, data on. Yeah, um, most uh, venture capitalists actually have what we call their thesis on their website, which talks about the maybe the kind of industries they invest in or the types of founders or where they want you to be in terms of traction. For example, Moneta Ventures uh, typically wants you to have $500,000 in annually recurring revenue before they'll think about investing in you. Um, some investors specifically want to invest in women-founded companies or uh, social ventures. So for venture capitalists, it's almost always there's a page about that. So I would check that out. You can also look at, they usually list the portfolio companies, the companies they've invested in. So you can get a kind of an idea of, of what space they're in. And most of them have a process for applying to present uh, that would be on their website, whether they're angels or uh, venture capitalists. But it's certainly better to get a warm introduction to them, which you probably can do if you're looking, if you're making use of mentors and advisors, uh, they typically know investors. So there's mentorship programs out there that you can take a look at. Uh, so I would highly recommend that, that you expand your, expand your tent. That will mean something to some of you and nothing to others. <laughs> It's a biblical yes. reference. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, um, so yes, I, um, those are those are all really good points. And like, keep in mind that angel investors being slightly different. When you get to a venture firm, a venture capital firm, they're a business. They want the right customers, right? They want the right startups in the door. So they're not going to try to keep it a secret. Like they 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 because they want to work with a certain kind of startup, and so they're going to be um, kind of kind of about that. Um, okay. 
Um, will they ask questions throughout at, uh, or at the end or 100% depends? So I think it depends. From my personal experience, earlier stage investors like angel investors tend to let companies finish. And then the later you are in a round, the more likely they are to interrupt. But I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Laura. Uh, I've really only seen the angel pitches and typically you have your 10 minutes or whatever, you do your pitch and then the questions start. They don't usually interrupt during the pitch for angel for angel investor meetings. But be prepared for anything because it gonna happen right. at some point do enough pitches. Um, okay, uh, if you're a woman owned company, should that be in your deck? I would say like as a default probably, um, but again, know your audience. It's gonna be really important to some investors and not at all important to others. And you know, if it's uh, something that's anti-important to an investor, then maybe you don't wanna pitch to them at all, but um, yeah. you know, that's the kind of thing you can find. Yeah. Well, when you, and when you show, you know, who, who your officers are, who your founders are. Uh, if you're showing, it's usually you show a picture of the person. So, you know, they might figure that out. Some <laughs> investor groups might want to invest uh, in LGBTQT plus. Did I get that right? Um, so if that's in their statement, you probably want to let them know if, um, if there's someone on your team who uh, falls into that category. Cool. Which kind of brings up a point. You may have a basic deck, but you may need to modify it a little bit each time based on who you're presenting to, based on you know, what, what you know about that group, what they say their uh, um, thesis is, you know, that sort of thing. So some customization might be required. Um, should we incorporate before pitching to investors, even if early stage? I mean, you're not going to be able to get funding unless you have, um, you know, a proper legal structure for your company. But I think it's going to depend on what early stage is. I do caution against doing that kind of thing too soon. Um, but my guess is that by the time you get in, and don't construe this as legal advice, of course, but um, I think by the time that you get to a point where you're fundable, meaning that like you're, you, you tip the balance of that math and it's like worth making a bet on, on you and your company, you're probably at that stage already, or at least you're okay to come at that, at that stage. Um, it should be worth a few thousand dollars to, um, to do. Um, but if that few thousand dollars isn't worth it to you, you're also not fundable. So. That, that's um, true. I was just going to say, if you're not willing to invest in yourself to get a proper legal structure, why w uh, you're not betting on yourself, why should investors bet on you? Totally. Yeah. Totally, totally. And we are over time. Josh said he could hang out a little bit more to answer questions. So Josh, you let us know uh, how much more time y you yeah. want to go. Do okay, we want to cool. go? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, do we want to say 5.45? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, that's about, um, let's say about 10 more minutes. Cool. So yeah, keep uh, questions dropping in the in the chat if you, if you have them or, or raise your Zoom hand if you want to ask a question that way. In the meantime, I want to show you, um, I, this might be the same one that Laura linked in the chat earlier, but I wanted to show you two slides from a recreation of Airbnb's pitch deck. And um, the idea here is, to as how you can convey information very simply. So I do not agree with everything in this deck. This was somebody recreating Airbnb's original deck um, in a way that they thought was great. But um, the I, so I don't agree with everything. But that, that's that's okay. We're not gonna not gonna really um, agree with um, uh, everything. Oh, uh, before I answer that, so Tony says, are you uh, are you okay to connect on LinkedIn? Yes. So if you want to connect with me, you can hit up jdm.bio in your in your browser and you can follow me on, on Twitter or connect with me on, on LinkedIn or, or whatever else or subscribe to my my YouTube channel and make all kinds of videos on entrepreneurship as well. I have a, a live show that I do every Friday. So there's one tomorrow at 11 a.m. on the six books entrepreneurs uh, uh, need to to read that I, I co-host with my, with my friend Dan Cassis Murray of the Lead Innovator. I have a podcast that comes out every couple of weeks. So um, anyway, if you want to connect, absolutely connect with me. Thank you, Laura, for dropping the, the link in that. Definitely connect. I love connecting with people. So by all means, yes. Okay, so now Airbnb. 
Um, so this is, I'm just like showing you on slide share here because I wanted to show you a couple slides, um, but, and I, I do have these somewhere. So um, problem side, you can see like, again, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. So they have a two-sided market, but they're talking about the problem for a customer and talking about a problem for, for a hotel, right? And then they're implying what the, um, uh, they're implying what the solution is here. Like, oh, that's how we're really diagnosing the problem. Um, okay, so then they talk about the solution a little bit more. Um, and then they talk about market validation, which is where they start looking at, okay, um, there's uh, 630,000 um, on uh, people on the, on couchsurfing.com, right? So that's like, oh, okay, there is a, a group of people out here are interested in this. That's kind of cool, right? And then 17,000 on New York City's Craigslist. So they give you some kind of early data. But this is one of the first two slides that I wanted to show you. So this is the Tam Sam Som, um, for those of you who, who were curious about that, that's basically what they're showing here. And so they're talking about the how many total trips booked in the market, meaning the absolute cap for Airbnb is if they had 100% of every trip made around the world, which of course they're not gonna get that silly, right? But if they were, that's 1.9 billion plus. And then they go, okay, but um, we're in the budget and online trip subcategories. So if you're booking through a travel agent, that doesn't apply. Or if your corporate office is booking it, that probably doesn't apply either. So our subset of that is 532 million. So we really can't get any higher than that. That's the only amount, this is the, of this 1.9 billion, we can only service 532. And then um, of that, we think we can get the market share of 10.6 million, right? So the this part here uh, on this slide, they're going to say why 2.6 million. I don't have the logic here because this was 2011, but they have, but they had some logic here that they said out loud for where 2.6 million came from. So then they move on and talk about what the product looks like and they have a really simple kind of demo thing here. But then they come back to this business model slide, and this is the one that I wanted to show you. So 10.6 million. Look at that. They brought back in the number. 10.6 million is how many we think we're going to get. So when we talk about the business model. We're talking about 10.6 million trips. We're talking about we take a 10% commission. That's it. The Airbnb makes money other ways, but they're saying we take a 10% commission on each transaction. 10.6 million trips, a $20 fee per trip, translates to $200 million in revenue. 2008 to 2011. That's kind of how they throw that out. So, and they have little details here in case you need more, which of course they said out loud, what does that $20 come from? Well, it's $70 a night at three nights because that's the average fee that we, that, you know, that we can expect. But notice all, there's a lot of nuance that's happening here. So one is if you notice that it, it's math, right? 10.6 million times 20, right? But the idea here is that they didn't do 10.6 times 20. They rounded, it's 10 times 20. Then it's $70 a night at three nights is $210, but they didn't, uh, right, which um, uh, would, would, if we took a 10% on $210 would be $21, but they said 20. Why? Because these are easy numbers. Like when you start saying we're going to get 21 million and we're going to get $210 million in revenue or whatever, you start like complicating in that way, it, it decreases clarity. It dilutes your message here. So you're being simple and it's on the pessimistic side. They didn't round up, they round it down because it didn't matter, right? Because we're saying if we serve 10.6 million people over the next three years at an average of $20 a night, that gives us 200 million in revenue. So they're easy numbers to digest and everyone's going to remember 20 million or sorry, $20 and everyone's going to remember 200 million. No one's going to remember it if you gave that with a decimal. Plus, it's all made up anyway. You're not actually going to get 10.6. You might get 10.4. You might get 9.8, right? You might get 12.2. It doesn't matter. The point is like we're throwing a number right here and then making your production. So it's a really simple way to convey that kind of information. So those were the two slides that I, that I wanted to share. Is it doesn't take a lot of information to, con it doesn't take a lot of detail to convey something kind of simply. So I wanted to make sure I shared, I shared that as an, as an example. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna drop a link for your um, your startup shop talk uh, recording on pitching because there's some additional information in that people might want to check out uh, and and we'll be sending I'll be sending you guys an email we have all sorts of stuff uh, in the startup universe in the Sacramento region about pitching to investors and that sort of thing uh, but uh, some of you asked a couple questions related to you know your startup being ready to pitch and next thursday startup sack is hosting a workshop called being deal ready that's going to be taught by an attorney and they'll handle things like do you need to be incorporated and and things of that nature so i'll hunt down that link and post it here but i'll also send it to you you might want to attend sounds like you should attend um Okay, so 
if you're currently serving a single market, say Sacramento, but your product could serve many, many, many more cities, do you show Tam Sam Som for both Sac and other cities? So it depends on what your ask is. If your if your ask is to grow in Sacramento, then it's probably part of your you know of your total addressable market, but it's certainly not going to become part of your you know obtainable market because you're only operating in Sacramento. But if you're pitching to take what's working in Sacramento to Cleveland, then it does matter, right? Because now you're talking about that being your attainable market too. So I think it's going to depend a little bit more on exactly what your story is and exactly what you're at, you know, you're raising money for, but what you want to capture here to like be, um, to, to give a, a little bit of, um, to concretize it a little bit is you want to convey the size of the opportunity. The opportunity is how much you can actually get. And so you want to be bottom up and say, this is a story that we can do. So if you're saying like five years from now, we're going to be in 10 cities, then it absolutely makes sense to mention that as part of your pitch, because it's part of your growth strategy. And it's part of that theory of hugeness, right? But part of the theory is how you get from Sacramento to a bunch of other cities. So um, that's kind of a, a rough, a rough answer to that. Yeah. Last minute questions. Yeah, so we're just about, we're down to 18. We're up to 30 at some point. So thank you guys for, for sticking around. Uh, um, Josh and I show up every Wednesday morning to One Million Cup Sacramento, where uh, two startup companies present. And we also have like free form chat time before and after. So, uh, you know, if you got more questions for us, if you pop into One Million Cups, we might be able to answer those for you. And uh, I'll, oh, thank you, Josh, you beat me to that. So uh, every Wednesday morning, we open the doors at 8.45 a.m., the Zoom doors, and uh, it goes officially from nine to 10. And then uh, we hang out after 10 for at least 15 minutes if uh, people wanna chat or ask questions. It's also an opportunity for you to practice presenting your startup and get some feedback from an audience of your peers. We usually have about 30 people attend. And, and also you, you get to unmute yourself and ask your questions. So <laughs> it's much more of a community. So I encourage you to, to come. I definitely think I'm thoroughly biased here, but I definitely think you should all come hang out with us at One Million Cups on Wednesday yeah. mornings. Yeah, it's free um, powered by the community. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So, um, I will, uh, Laura. Um, I'll I'll share with you the the link to that deck right now, and uh, you can share that however makes sense to you. Okay. All right, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and formally end. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you so much, Josh. The recording will be available on the Startup Sack website.